Good evening, folks. Welcome to the Friday Frothy. Yano Glenny, how are you, mate? Great, mate. Great to be back in the bar. Mate, another interview special tonight and another... Great player. football. Well, I won't say AFL. VFL player. Yeah. For... North Melbourne. The great North Melbourne, North mate. Melbourne. So yeah. we're, we're very, uh, very lucky. So strap yourself in. Yeah. Absolutely thrilled to interview uh, Daryl Schimmelbush. What a name. Schimmelbush. So stick around for some great stories. This is the Friday Frothy. Guys, I'm Tweet News. You're all listening to the Friday Frothy. What a fantastic show. Please welcome to the Friday Frothy, Daryl Schimmelbush. Shimmer, you're right. We're us calling you Shimmer. Is that okay? That's fine, mate. Uh, yeah, go for well, it. Welcome to the Frothy, mate. So so glad that you can come on and have a bit of a chat with us. Well, hey, just, just before we do start, Daryl, just want to let you know you, we're going to have a talk to you tonight about uh, the AFL team in, in Tasmania and what it's going to mean for us. But uh, first of all, we'd just like to go through and have a bit of a talk to you about your career, where you came from, uh, all your, your heroes and all that sort of stuff, if you don't mind. Um, so... First of all, can you just give us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you started playing, how you got into football, where you grew up? Okay, uh, both Wayne and I were uh, born and bred in Brunswick. Um, we played all our junior football uh, in the Essendon District Football League for a little club called Brunswick City. And uh, once we reached the under-17s, we, well, Wayne went up to Brunswick in the VFA first. And I followed a couple of years later. So Wayne was recruited from Brunswick VFA. Yep. And uh, I followed several years later. Now you're, okay. you're the younger brother, aren't you? I'm the younger one, yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, so from, from Brunswick, that's obviously, um, you were in the area for... Well, that's close, isn't it? Because Carlton or Brunswick there runs into almost North Melbourne. Yeah, right? so yes. Well, I can tell you a little bit there. Yeah. Wayne and I, Wayne and I uh, obviously through our parents, were Carlton supporters. So that's Carlton, right. Princess Hill, back in those days, yeah. wasn't far from our home. Yep. And we used to walk up there on a Saturday to watch the game. Uh, all the supporters had pushed us up on the kiosk roof. And we'd watch the game from there. Uh, and on every other week, we'd walk up the hill to Windy Hill and watch Essendon. But we were Carlton supporters. Okay. But uh, I, because of uh, the zoning back in those That's days, right. yep. we, we Brunswick, was, Brunswick was tied to where we lived in West Brunswick was tied to North Melbourne. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was the thing, <clears throat> Daryl, back in those days. It didn't matter if you lived in Tassie or... Yeah, Western Australia, Victoria, well, sorry, uh, but, well, Tasmania, but I know in where I was, if I always said this story when we've interviewed someone before, way to cul-de-sac. On one side, down here, we've obviously had Glenorchy Football Club, and on the other, so at one end of the cul-de-sac was North Hobart, and if I walked yeah. to the other end, it was Glenorchy. So you, you the go. Rodney Eads, all they come from the Glenorchy, and you... Yeah, and yeah, you, you're uh, some good footballers come through North Hobart there too. But that's how it was yeah. back in those days. Jim. Um, Darryl, mate, when you when you actually got to North Melbourne, um, you started. You played in the reserves, and you won the best and fairest. That's correct. Correct. And were you due to play? With it? Oh, I heard a what rumor that you may have got to play in the '77 Grand Final. Was You've got your information pretty right. <laughs> well, hello. Yeah, well, hello. Well, well, it's a scoop. So you were yes. going to be in that, Daryl? Um, well, I played all year in the reserves. And as you just said, I, uh, I won the Gardner Medal. Yes, that was great. That was uh, on great. a count back from Bob Hurd. Yep, yep. Uh, I think Bob only played uh, eight games or 13 games or something like that. I played the whole uh, 18. So I had a bit of an advantage there. And... Uh, North had a bad game in the uh, first semi-final, uh, so obviously um, my name came up because I played pretty well in the first final. Um, my name came up and uh, Barras pulled me aside on the Tuesday night and said, you're in for this week's game. Oh. 
And so <laughs> every young every young kid every young kid has a ambition to you know play a final at the MCG yeah. wow. or play in a grand final in the MCG and uh, in the seniors of course and this was my obviously my opportunity and uh, and I think why Barassi picked me to come up was he he, he pulls in a few of these uh, moves every now and again as you can probably remember he brought in Ted Hopkins um, yeah Carl. For a Colton final and Ted kicks five goals or something and won in the game. And I think he must have thought that's what I was going to be able to do. And uh, But not only that, both Wayne and I were very, very competitive in anything that we'd done against one another. Yeah. And Barras knew that. And uh, on the Tuesday night, after him announcing that I was in the side to everybody, I came up and trained with the seniors and he pitted Wayne against me. And he'd throw the ball out and uh, we'd fight and crawl and punch and scratch and headbutt one another, whatever we could to, <laughs> to, could to do to get the ball back to the ass. And he'd just knock it away and say, go and get it again. Oh, yeah. no. Yeah. Oh, oh, no. And uh, we just kept going at it, tackling one another, throwing one another down. And uh, in the end, uh, we got the ball back for the first time. And then obviously the next two came through. Then it came our turn again, and he'd done the same again. It just kept us going for about 10 minutes. And I beat him again <clears throat> in the end. And we're walking back to the end of the line. He said, you won't beat me again. <laughs> and in the last one, uh, I was about to handball the ball back to Barras, and uh, he tackled me, and it was a very muddy night. My, my ankle stuck in the mud as he twisted oh, me, and I just no. heard it snap. <laughs> uh, broken. So I was crawling across the ground to uh, Belt Wayne. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. And Barassi grabbed my arm and said, no, we need him. So oh, I obviously no. missed out. And I even then, I couldn't even run the lap of honour at the uh, grand final to get the, uh, get the you know, in those days, Brownlow medalist, Gardner medalist, the Morrish medalist used to run a lap of honour. Yeah, that's right. I couldn't even do that because my leg was in plaster. Couldn't, couldn't walk. Oh, I mean, wow. that is so sad. So you actually... So I missed, uh, missed the 77 grand final and yep. then obviously that was a tie and uh, obviously still in plaster for the re re uh, the uh, the next one, the next week that they won. So yeah, missed them both. Mate, that is mm. absolutely tragic. So that would have been your 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 first game for North Melbourne too, wouldn't it? Because it actually that would have been my first game. Too. Yeah, because it's there's just you actually well, debuted in '78. I, I would have been there had you played that game, mate. I, I went over. My father, when he was alive, he was he worked for Rothman Cigarettes over here, and I yeah. got over there as a kid. And uh, he his there was a guy down here, Rod Olson, that coached Geelong, played for Hawthorne. And I got to sit in the members there when that Manasseh got the ball and ran up the wing and bounced it half a dozen times. And I was there for the replay yeah. of that game. So I would have been watching you. There you go. That's yeah. disappointing. Yeah. Mate, yeah. This, I, don't, I don't know if I want to ask this question or not, but how, how long does it take you to, to sort of get over that or do you never get over it? Um, well, it certainly hurt. And uh, we still talk about it a fair bit and even... Um, even Wayne, when I see him get interviewed every now and again, he always brings it up as well. I mean, it was a bit of a joke at the time for him, but uh, he knows it meant a lot to me at that stage. Absolutely. That's sure. Yeah. Yeah. So he, did, he didn't get much of a Christmas present, mate. No. <laughs> <laughs> so um, look, I have heard about the competitiveness between, between you and Wayne. Um, and actually Roger told me about, you know, watching you two play table tennis and just hitting oh, balls yeah. backwards and forwards at each other. So um, obviously there was a lot of competition there, but you guys got on okay. You played in the same team and everything. So, yeah, it was all... Oh, yeah, cool. look, uh, just from a young age, we'd, uh, and I'm sure you would have done the same thing, we'd play footy in the backyard, we'd play cricket in the backyard, we'd play tennis in the backyard, whatever was... whatever season it was that's what we do and whatever we played we we're competitive with one another you yeah. know we and just wanted to win whatever we you know whenever we got a chance we wanted to win that was simple as that were you were you both good in all the different sports so it wasn't just afl um i reckon i i did play cricket but obviously um and i played for strathmore uh here in in melbourne but um obviously once football became 
my main goal. I let cricket die off a little bit. Wayne, Wayne was a very good cricketer. He's a good leg spin bowler. He probably could have made the Victorian side, but the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, football was his focus. Yeah. Okay. What what position, uh, Daryl or Shipman, did you actually predominantly play? You were only fairly short in stature. Obviously, uh, I was that too, mate. I was a rover. What what were you? Rover mainly That's rover it. or yeah, well, well I came into the side as a rover, yes. Yeah. Right. So I'm uh, 165, yep. and I think it's pretty much a tie between Paul Curry and myself to be the yeah, smallest two players that's ever played the game. That's, that's yeah, where I was going with that, because wow. Jeff actually, I, I mean, I did see you play. Mainly a lot of it was on TV, but, of course, down here, everything then was in black and white, a lot of it, back in those days, but... Um, yeah, Paul Carey, obviously a very a, a great uh, little footballer too at St Kilda. Yep. But uh, yeah, both of you, you know, as I said, the, the rest is history. Is you, it doesn't matter how tall you are. You, you get the ball. We were only talking about this the other day, Daryl, about the, the 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 sizes of these on balls now. You know, the six foot what six foot four, six, four. six foot six running yeah. around on, on on the ball. It's just incredible. Well, but then you get the little guy from the Western Bulldogs with the helmet, um, Caleb. Caleb Daniel. Yep. And he wouldn't have been much taller, Darrell, would he? I don't suppose he. Well, I'd he'd say he's a little bit taller, a little but bit taller, yeah. But look, he he he's small, and yeah, yeah, probably a little bit taller than what we are. But yeah, he has a good he has a crack. That's for he, sure. He does. He's a he's a good little. Uh, he uses the ball is, well. Is it a, is it a disadvantage now in the game to have not have the height? Um. Well, I think it's turned around a little bit. Back in those days when I played, uh, it was a high marking game. And you used to see every week in the replays, and I'm sure you guys did too, there'd always be a, a, a fantastic overhead mark. You know, Phil Baker, Paul Vander, yep. uh, I'll Peter mention Knight. a Hawthorne Blake, Peter, Peter Knight. Knight. Sorry, I'll help you with that. Always <laughs> spectacular marks because it was a kick and kick to a, you know, down the corridor where yeah, yeah. today's game is a running game. Yeah. And they feed it around the outside and they chip backwards and they chip sideways to maintain possession where it was a kick and kick and mark game back then yeah. and then if the ball got punched away by the defender it hit the ground and that's when the small blokes would come into play i i always think mate it's that they're a little bit spoiled these days they're a little bit precious they play under roofs at Mar yes and they want one down here in tasmania but i can remember watching the games and, and i've been to the grounds so i went through even as a kid we would went out to north melbourne i've been out to arden street been to you know, down to the Junction Oval and all these ovals. Even Glen Ferry was pint size. Um, you know, and of course they used to carry a lot of water, and uh, people used to cram in, mm. which was which was fantastic. You even had an elephant mate going around there one day. Uh, <laughs> Arden Street. Arden Street. Yeah, so yeah. They, they I was, I was well. there that day. You, you were there, really? so yeah, the elephant nice. got in. Uh, yeah. But uh, you know what I mean? The guys, the skill level. Mm. And I was going to ask you this because. Being professional footballers, which they are now, they're, let's be honest, they're paid mega good bucks. money, mega bucks. Mm. They're playing on pretty good, pristine grounds. You guys back in the day too, as we, we had to work and turn up and roll up and play footy and cricket and everything else. But, um, you know, I still can't get my head around the fact, mate, I was going to ask you the question, you know, you're 10 metres out, 15 <laughs> metres out, don't get me going. Yeah, no, 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 that's, <laughs> what they, I, that's what I want you to do, mate. They, they shut their eyes. I could shut my eyes, and I, I wasn't. I didn't play at any great level, yeah. but I probably would have kicked the goal, mate. And it would have been on an angle as well. And they can't yeah. kick it from ten metres out. I, I just I'm flabbergasted. Yeah. What the what look? The it's probably was, yeah. Sorry, what the question? Well, it's probably a more skillful game now. There's no doubt about that. Yes. Like exactly what you're talking about. They can pinpoint point a, uh, a pass, you know, thirty or forty metres away. Yep. and hit that bloke on the chest, but then when they line up for goals, they must get the heebie-jeebies and, and just doesn't don't follow the right procedure to get it through. Well, it was, be, well, it was it between the neck and, around, and the, the shoulders. And the around the body, yeah, exactly. Mate, exactly. They, uh, they, they look, you can even see it on their face when they, they, they actually look nervous. Yeah, they do. When they're coming in, where there's they some do. guys that are good, yeah. that, that can kick still yeah. now, yeah. and you can see it, that they want the ball. But there's yeah. a lot of guys there, they get it and they go, oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Darrell, that was one of the questions I'm going to ask you a little bit later. We're here now. I must ask you. So, your thoughts on the game, the current game now? Yeah, yeah. I know you're still watching it and you're a bit involved with it. Mm. But um, what are your thoughts on it? 
Look, um, I see a lot of the past players, um, and I speak to a lot of them, including Wayne and including other close friends that's played the game, and they have difficulty watching it nowadays. Yeah, okay. That's that's pretty sad. It's, it's it really? not the same game. Yeah. No, it's not. Yeah. And and some of the main points there, the, why why they don't like watching it, it's what the... Well, it's, it's more um, a basketball-type game or a soccer-type game. It's maintained pos- possession of the ball, you know, they'll... They'll get a, you know, they'll rush it in from the point and kick it, kick it out to a, a bloke on the back pocket or the half back flank, and then they turn around and come back the other way. Yeah. I mean, yeah. under Barassi, we had strict guidelines. It was down the corridor. Yep. Yep. Add it, add and it. yes, yeah. there was a lot of shootouts back in those days where, you know, the side that went, you know, kick the most goals wins the game, which is what it's all about. And uh, it was down the corridor. And if you've you've got your uh, say 75% or 85% of your players on top on that game, you'll win the game. Yeah. And that's the way it was played. It was man on man, that's get the right. ball, kick it on to the next group, man on man. And then obviously the swoopers would swoop in if it went to the ground. There were still lots of handballs like there is nowadays. Um, but, look, you know, it was a genu- genuine man on man contest in most, most of the areas around the ground, not where you see blokes running, you know, 20 and 30 and 50 metres clear by themselves with nothing, no one on them. It's, yeah. it's not the name of the game. It's a bit weird. No, I, 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 I'm, I'm from your era, mate. I, I 100% agree with you. And I, I mm. still follow footy. I still follow the team that I've always barracked for. But I I see it now. It is it is hard to watch mm. some of it. And as Glenn just said, I get frustrated and, watching it. And, and the rule players. changes really every do. year. So many rule changes. And sometimes it's, within the year. It, it's, I, 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 well, the head part's another thing altogether. But, I mean, right. yeah, back in our day, the, you, you'd, you'd put your head over the ball and, unfortunately, you'd, you'd probably get it knocked off. But the um, <laughs> but still, that's we knew. And I, I well, they, we knew what we, was what we what signed up for. And you, yeah. you went out there yeah. and if you, you copped a whack, you you probably give it back or you cop another one. But uh, yeah. <laughs> on this I, day... I hate to keep harping back, but, you know, back then there was one umpire... Yes. And I watch a lot of the old replays as well. And the one umpire got control of the game. Yep. The game flowed. There was not as many ball ups as what there is today. Today we got four umpires, and they all don't seem to be uh, on the same page level. One bloke will be playing, holding the ball. The other bloke will say, "Play on." And another, the third umpire might say, "Well, that's uh, holding the man." I mean, yeah. they, they're not. They're not uh, synchronised together, the four umpires now. And I think it's very hard. If someone came in from overseas and sat down to watch our game, they'd say, what the hell's going on? Yeah, One bloke's absolutely. playing this free kick, the other bloke's playing it the other way. And, and, and you see them, they, they look at each other and wait, you know, yeah. who's going to call yeah. it? You know, yeah. you go, come on, yeah. someone call it. What's going on? You know, it's, uh, it's just crazy. Absolutely yeah. crazy. There's too many ball-ups nowadays. There is. There is. There is. Hey, just talking about... Um, with the players and stuff, do you are you actually involved at the club? Do you get to see or speak to the new players, the guys who are playing these days? Um, so I've been on the past players committee for the last five years. Uh, first four years I was player welfare. So obviously if, if a past player needed surgery or a knee operation or something, you know, anything, I'd sort of push them in the right direction to get, the welfare to keep, you know, to make them happy. Yeah, okay. Uh, last year I got voted in as president, so I'm president now. Yep. Um, so I'm down the club a fair bit. I have met several of the newer players or the, the, the current players, but I haven't met them all. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And the facility down there um, is really good too now, down at North Melbourne. They've done a lot of work, you yeah. know, obviously around the Oval well, with the... With their new facilities and that, is that... You, know, you touched on it before. I mean, uh, Arden Street used to be a bit of a bog sure. hole. It was. Uh, it is a prestige ground now. It is fantastic yeah. condition. And the facilities that these guys have got nowadays, it's unbelievable yeah. do they, compared do they actually, to what we had. Do they actually yeah. play games on, on there or is it just training? The girls play there, yeah. The girls do the play girls there? Do. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's getting stronger? Um, well, I thought it was, but the AFL came out this week and said that uh, 
they're struggling financially wise at the moment. But uh, look, it's there's a lot of women down there, and Darren Crocker's a coach, and uh, yeah, I think the girls made the finals last year, and he's looking to go a couple of better places this year. So yeah, okay. okay. What, what was it like playing in the in the team there? I mean, you got players like Malcolm Blight, Ross Glendenning, David Dench, Keith Gregg, our mate Roger. Um, just the same few. Your brother Wayne. It's a it's a bit of a, a star lineup. We had some yeah, some good ones there too. Look, I felt I felt very I felt very privileged to be involved. Um, yeah. You know, I can always remember the first day I got the letter from Ron Joseph to say that uh, you know I've got the um, the letter to come down to club to train to see if I can make it, and then uh, turn up the first night and. Uh, Barassi, who was my idol back in those days as a coach, uh, started talking to everybody and I look around the room and as you suggested, you know, you got Brent Crosbull, Mick Nolan, um, Gary Dempsey came a couple of years later, Arnold yeah, Brightus, uh, yeah. Daryl Sutton. Um, there was some great names there. Keith Gregg, David Dench, who I was with on the weekend. Oh, really? And I then after that, after he finished speaking and before we went on the ground, he came up to me, Barassi, and said, uh, who the hell are you and why are you doing here? You're too small. Oh, that's what he <laughs> oh, said, really? was it? Oh, that was my no. first night. Well, uh, I was actually going to ask you, so what, what was your relationship like with him? Look, Prove him wrong. I think... Um, <laughs> In hindsight, and knowing what I know now, he he was more of a psychologist, Barass. Yeah. And I reckon he said that to me to make me yeah. make me train harder and want it more and more. And yeah. uh, although he he knew in games who to who to berate, who to go crook at, who to who to get the best out of, you know, he'd always yell at at Wayne or David Dench or Arnie Brightus or. Uh, um, oh, other players that he knew he could attack and, and berate and get stuck in them to get the best out of them where he'd never go near Keith Gregg or Malcolm Blight because I know if he yelled at them, they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't perform to the best that they could. Yeah, okay. Right. Wow. And all, He's a bit of a psychologist. So, yeah. you know, he might have yelled and screamed and carried on at me a couple of times obviously to get the best out of you through the game, but then, you know, he'd be the first person that'd come up with you after the game and, and buy a beer. So okay. yeah. he was a very smart man in that way. You, you play with a lot of great footballers and obviously in your own team, you don't even have to go too far there. But was anyone that stood out to you? I mean, apart from, you know, the obvious... Look, ones, um, the lights and them. well, Denchy, I reckon. Yep, oh. full back. Denchi changed the way fullbacks play. You know, he'd get it and he'd just run. He'd kick it. He'd follow it up and get a re return handball and then kick it into the forward line. Uh, I, I thought he was just one of the greatest players that we had. Yeah, we had Malcolm Blythe, the one of Brownlow. We had my good mate Ross Glenn Denning, one of Brownlow, and Keith's one too. Uh, so we had some damn good players through that period, but Denchi just... He never, he never, we hardly ever got beaten. Yeah, well, he was one of the uh, guys that like the full backs then. I mean, you had him and, I don't know, Carlton, mm. Jeff Southby, was he another one? And, yep. you know, yep. well, Kelvin Moore, am I getting, still in the same era? There was some, Kelvin, there was some good, good full yeah. backs back in those days, there that's was. for sure. And, and, and that's, mm. it, it all started a lot of it from the back line, did it? I mean, if you really yes. think about it, it started from mm. there. And as you said, it was, it was more up the, up the guts, I suppose, and yeah. you put it that way, and direct. Uh, a direct. Mm. There was no mucking around. Yeah, yeah. But I still reckon, as I said, I, I still thought the school level, especially in the box, where I was going with that, was the grounds wasn't as good, mm. boggy conditions, and some of the school level I thought was still fantastic. I mean, these guys were doing stab kicks and yeah. everything else, but uh, I reckon it was fantastic with some of the grounds they played on to, to you know, and as you said, high scores, mm. you know, but still. Mm. It was, well, 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 that was the beauty of Barassi as well. You know, if it was a, a wet training night, he'd uh, get the balls out there and put them in a couple of puddles of water and then uh, we'd practice, uh, we'd still do our normal drills, but then you'd be practicing kicking the ball off the ground. Yeah. So, and practicing handball with a wet ball and practicing flat hand marks rather than trying to grab the mark on the side. So he was a smart man in that way too. You'd practice to play in the wet, where nowadays... 
these guys, if it's wet, they don't even go on the training track. They would stay inside, indoors, yeah. and do all their training indoors. And then when you see them in a wet game, that's they can't crazy. control the ball because it's too slippery. That's yeah. so crazy. Yeah, it is. Because that's part of the game. Of course that's it is. That's what we play. It, get, it, it, is a, it is a winter sport, uh, after oh, all. Geez. And we're Tasmanian, and you're in Victorian. And it's, I know you might say it's a couple of degrees warmer, but... Trust me, back when I was a kid, it wasn't real warm. <laughs> Even you used to kick the dew off, or, as I used to call yeah. it, when I was in underage, like you would have been. And yeah. and then when you progress and you come up into the senior football or whatever, you obviously it was a little bit warm, but oh, not too much. So how how did, how did he compare to to other coaches yeah. in that in that in those days in toughness? Was did you rate him as probably? Well, there was there was a few that, there was a few going around at that time. Um, obviously, there was Kanga Kennedy, uh, Ken, John Kennedy at Hawthorne. Yep, he was a very tough man, very hard man. Uh, Tommy Hafey was at Collingwood, so. I think a lot of them, you know, used to learn from Barras and, and practice, um, you know, get stuck into their players where the coaches nowadays, if they start yelling and screaming at blokes, they, uh, they're they not allowed to do that anymore. Well, so. You've got to be a psychologist, oh, like you said. I think so you've, got a, you've got to uh, treat them with kit and gloves, hey, what I call it. Mate, well, just yeah. while, while we're talking about coaches, so your, your thoughts just briefly on Stewie Jew during the week, mate? Look, I thought he was very stiff. Um, I thought he was starting to do some good stuff yeah. with with the players he had and they were winning some good contests and, you know, we're speaking about the wet ball before from apparently when they played up at uh, Darwin the other week, he put oil all over the balls and got the guys out there uh, in the training session with, ball, uh, with the footballs with oil all over them because that was the conditions they were going to have when they played because it was very... Um, very hot up there and there was a lot of uh, condensation and dew over the ground. So I thought that was a, a brilliant idea to do and um, they obviously won that game. It was against the Doggies, I think. Oh, do you think they're a bit, do you think, uh, Darrell, they're a bit quick to uh, look at the coach these days? It's the coach's fault. It's the coach's it always fault. seems to fall to the coach first, I think. Well, it Wouldn't does. Want to be one. Well, even the great Barassi, I, I I always said, I don't care who you are, if you, if you haven't got the cattle, as they say, I mean, you, you can be a good side and a coach can can mould you, but if you haven't got the cattle, it's going to be hard. North Melbourne, obviously, back in 76 and around that time, they had their era where they were successful. You know, if you go back, Richmond in the 80s and all this sort of thing, Hawthorne later on, North, you know, even down the West Coast, coming in 90, 91 and started to perform, but unless you had the cattle... And that, what I'm saying is that uh, it it makes it hard then, for then, coaches. Then you're spot on there. Look, uh, Barras won a premiership at Carlton. He had great players. And as or when North decided to recruit him, the 10-year rule came in and the club went out and bought Doug Wade, John Rantel. That's right, Rantel. Yeah. Uh, they got my brother. They got Blighty across. Um there were several other players that came from different areas as well. They went out on a mission to get him the players to win a premiership. To win it. Well, that's how I And they started it. in 1972. And in 1975, they won the premiership because of what you're saying, we had the cattle. Yeah, the when Barras left North Melbourne, he went to Melbourne. Yep. They didn't have the cattle. He didn't have the same success that he had at North Melbourne. Well, we, he, we left North, we... he left Melbourne and went to Sydney. And again, he never had the cattle there. So... Yes, you can be a good coach and you can have all the plans and all the uh, the drills that you need, but if you haven't got the players, you're not going to be successful. It's simple well, as that. We, we, we had a guy down here, Darrell, if you know this guy, but we, we interviewed a guy, uh, a bloke called Tony Martin, down here. He won about three William Leach medals. He played at Melbourne under Barassi. Yeah. I was lucky enough to play football with him here, but he was a superb footballer, I've heard himself went to Port Adelaide. That was before yep. your Kerner hands and all them come over. Played in the grand final there. But he, he his football was left short of two with injury with, with knee, but uh, with his knee. But he said exactly that. But, you know, same thing. Brassy was the coach there. They brought in uh, the big guy with the, what's his name? Mark Jackson. They had, oh, yeah. he had to yep. put up with those sort of guys. <laughs> but, you know, the, you know, and the big bull Baker was there, of course. Um Gary Baker, mm. yeah, these sort of fellas. But uh, you know, 
they were just didn't have the success. So was was there salary caps and stuff like that in, the, in no. those days? It was just no. Slava. It was no, it was open slather. So they could, just, they could purchase any player they wanted at, at any price? Yes. Yeah, okay. But back then there wasn't a lot of money involved, I don't think. Yeah, no, yeah. Mm. My word. Hey, just just quickly, and we'll get on to the Tassie, Tassie stuff in a second, but um, your toughest opponent you've ever played on, who would you rate? Okay, that's a good one. Um, Tough one. We can, you can imagine who my first game was against. Yeah. One, one of the greatest of all times, Lee Matthews. Yeah, yeah really. well done, mate. You played so, on him. Uh, I met him. I, I made him. I'm glad I just met him because I wouldn't have liked to play on him. Like you. How, did it, <laughs> how did it go? <laughs> how did that go? <laughs> Look, I, I think I played okay. I, it's a long time ago now, but my job was to, to tag him. To negate him, yeah, yeah. And, you know, a player like him, you, and I used to tag Gary Wilson as well. Oh, wow. Uh, and and a couple of other really top line rovers. And the good thing when you're tagging, you're learning because they're dragging you to the ball. Yeah. 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 No. So then it's just a matter of when you get to the ball to try and stop him from getting it, you get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How many games did you end up playing in the end? For, for okay. The um, rule, I mean, the uh, all the. Uh, information that i see on uh, the afl website it says 47 games i believe i played 49. yep yeah um back in those days there was a lot of night games as well back then they didn't count them oh that's right yeah that's right yeah and 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 uh i think i played about 11 or 12 night games so I say 60, I'm happy yeah. with that. <laughs> yeah, no, wait, that's a fantastic <laughs> effort. Were, Absolutely. Were you, when when you finished playing footy, was is it because of an injury or what, what happened? Did you moved on to something, something different? Uh, another good question. <laughs> so I played four years at North. Um, second year, I broke my neck. Oh, really? Playing footy. Wow. And uh, that was at about round six. I had to wear a neck brace for uh, a normal neck brace for about four weeks, and then I was in one of those construction con- uh, neck braces with the steel bars at back and front, mm. and I was in that for six six months. Wow! And then, as soon as I got it out, I got with the weight coach down at the club, Max Ryan, and he set me a program, and I built my neck up that. With that much muscle around it, I couldn't get in proper shirts to fit me. And uh, then turned up at the next pre-season and the club came to me and said, what the hell are you doing here? We've got a letter from your neurosurgeon to say you're never allowed to play football again. Oh, no. So they wouldn't pay for it, but I had to get four more opinions from four other neurosurgeons to, to let me continue to play. Um, so I missed a fair bit of the pre-season training because it wouldn't let me on the ground, but I just kept pursuing it because I just kept wanting to play. Mm. And I got through by the skin of my teeth. I went to four other neurosurgeons and had multiple tests with both of those, multiple x-rays, and uh, it all came up okay. So they let me back on the training track. And then in 1979, I started to play regular games every year, every game. So I played... Most games under Barass, and then Barass left, and Blighty took over. Yep. And then he turned around and said, no, Daryl, you won't be playing here. We've recruited Kim Hodgman and Peter Spencer. And I said, well, we'll see about that. And I think I played every game until he got sacked with, um, with uh, I think, about three rounds to go. Okay. And Barry Cable came in as coach. Barry stood in front of us, I'll never forget it, and said, everyone's going to get a fair go under me. It won't be the same under Malcolm and the same under Barassi. Every, every player's going to get a fair go. I was the only player that got dropped that week. <laughs> mm-hmm. So went back to reserves, kicked five goals in the, against Melbourne and uh, worked my way back into the side for the last two games, which was Witten Oval against Footscray. And I think I was on the bench all day, maybe got on in the last quarter. And then the last game that was ever played at Albert Park, uh, Swans game or South Melbourne game yeah, back then. Over, and again, I was on the bench, but probably got a half that game and played pretty well, I thought. 
three weeks later, uh, I think I got the sack. Yeah, okay. Does it was it hard? So it was no fair go for me. No. Was it um, hard? Yeah. yeah. So I found my way to Collingwood. Mm-hmm. And it's one club I never really wanted to play for because mm-hmm. it's a Can't love-hate relationship that, with Collingwood. <laughs> yeah. And Tom Hafey was there. He was the one that rang me up and said, I want you down here. Yeah, okay. And I went there. Now, if you thought Barassi was tough for fitness and training, Tom Hafey was tougher. We'd be trained at 5 o'clock in the morning. And as you touched on earlier, we had other jobs to go to. I was a plumber by trade back then. And, mm-hmm. you know, you'd go to train and train your guts out and then have to go and get a shower and get your overalls on and go to work as a plumber. And anyway, I, I thought I'd done pretty well at Collingwood. I um, got through all the pre-season and I got made the final cut. And um, Graham Allen called me aside the, the, the Thursday night or the Tuesday night before the first game and said, we're not going ahead with your clearance. So I missed out again after putting in five months pre-season mm. training under Collingwood. And it wasn't a lot of money. I think it was only a transfer fee of about 15000 back then, but they didn't want to pay it. So I ended up in Adelaide. Yeah, okay. So a guy come over from, um, drove over in his cab and said, we want you to play over here. So they flew me over and um, showed me around Adelaide and I ended up playing, staying in there and uh, playing for West Torrance. Oh, you played at West Torrance, there you go. Well done. Mm. How long, how long for? Uh, I think I was there for five years, and here we go again. First tr- first practice match for West Torrens, which was in that same year, I was super fit and real keen to go because I thought I'd go over there and give it two or three years that I could show them I could play football and hopefully get recruited back. And I'd done my, uh, done my knee, and it wasn't through a tackle or anything like that. I uh, just went to change direction and my knee caved in. Oh, boy, oh, boy. Well, you so I missed, who, missed the who, whole who, year. Yeah. No, I ended up playing about four games. Yeah. Uh, and then um, I had to have a full Nico. And then uh, the club could see where I was and what sort of bloke I was. I'd put in the hardest pre-season you could put in after I got the knee out of the uh, out of the plaster. Uh, ended up vice-captain. That year I also um, made the state side. So Victoria played Adelaide. Um, Adelaide put in a call to, to uh, obviously the VFL and said, "Look, we're thinking of playing Daryl Schimmelbush. Uh, can we have him?" And they said, "Well, he won't be getting a game in the Victorian side. You can have him." So I ended up playing against Wayne was captain of Victoria. So oh, really? <laughs> Yeah. You didn't pay him back, did you? Mate? Yeah, did you have a crap? No, I didn't uh, get a chance. <laughs> didn't get a chance. I don't we used to fight now after I brought but, this uh, up. But Adelaide won. Adelaide won. That, well, at that stage, they had some fantastic players. Dix Kernahan, Motley. Yeah. And McIntosh, Platten, McGuinness. You know, the list goes on. The list on. goes on. Uh, yeah, well. John Roberts, uh, Rick Davies. So, yeah, we uh, comfortably, comfortably beat Victoria over there. Oh, and then effort. I played, I think, a couple of weeks later uh, to see for the for the uh, championship against West uh, Western Australia, and uh, we had to travel to Western Australia and play. And unfortunately, um, they knocked us off. Well, what I'll say, Daryl, one thing, mate, you, throughout your football career, some only get to play mm. three or four games, mm. and they never play again because of the injuries injury. that you've sustained. Mm. So for you to play at that level and do what you've done, and to get I, reckon back each time. I reckon it's fantastic. You don't hear a lot about it. No, you don't. And, and, you, and you, you know, Daryl's right because there's, there's not a lot on Google or Wikipedia or anything like that. And there's none of this on there. And it's just, this is why we love doing what we do. Yeah. And we get to find out about people, you know, that, that we just, you don't know about it. It's fantastic. Well, you, you played for the love of the game back then. That's a, that's a trouble. You wasn't paid. There was no big money. You wasn't paid yeah. a fortune and that. You played for the love of it and the jumper. Yeah. As I said, as soon as you put the jumper on, cross the line. But uh, now it's a totally different mm. game. You're one hundred percent right again, Glenn. Um, I got called in when it looked like I was going to get my first game, and he said, "How much a game do you want?" I said, "Mate, all I want to do is play. That's it. Yeah, all that's I want to do is play for North Melbourne. Money doesn't mean nothing to me." Yeah, yeah. yeah. And in fact, rates, one year, rates. one year there, I think I had to pay the club money because. Oh, um, I used to be late. I used to get late to training every Sunday morning. I'd cop a fine, 
And back in those days, you might have got um, a pair of shorts, one yeah, one sure. white, one blue, yeah. Yeah. a pair of socks and a tracksuit. Now, if you needed other gear to get you through the year, you had to buy it. Wow. And that's I think that year I bought, Same we year. made the grand final and I bought six grand final tickets for all my mates and I ended up paying the club $1,600. No way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, jeez, mate. This is bloody horrible. So, so what do you think now when you, you look at these current players and what they're getting and, and all the, you know, I, they get a contract and, no, I don't want to play here anymore. I want to go somewhere else. How, how do you how do you take that on? Oh, look, uh, you know before, you know, it's so disappointing when, you know a player's getting 700000 a year and he's 15 metres out from goals and can't even slot it through. I mean, yeah, it's a bit disappointing. <laughs> and, and on that too, you know, Wayne, Wayne tells a story uh, to his mates and you're privileged to this now. Um, I think in 74 they played in a grand final. So that was only his third year there. Against Richmond it could have been. He got $35 to play in the grand final. That's unbelievable, isn't it? 110,000 people there. Well, wow. your, your parents must have been really proud of both of you boys because obviously you were both you know, great footballers and Wayne went on to you know, also captain and, and coach. He yep. had a go at coaching there, didn't he, down there at North yep. Melbourne. And, yeah, and you know, you both represented. Uh, Dad, Dad would have been, been proud of you. Mm. Dad would have been. He uh, unfortunately died when, when I was 12, so Wayne would have oh. been 14. Okay, okay. But... We weren't, you know, everyone was touting then from our junior football that we'd play a, a VFL. Yeah. And Dad would have been proud, but he never seen us get there. But uh, Mum, oh, God, was she proud. I bet. Absolutely. I bet. Uh, well done, mate. I bet. Mm. Mate, um, we'll, uh, we'll jump over into this Tassie team, if you don't mind, and have a yep. quick little chat about that, and we'll let you go. Um, Mate, just straight off the bat, as you know, we've got the 19th licence has been granted to Tasmania as a team, and we're all excited about it down here, but there's a lot of people who aren't. And I just wanted to get some perspective from an ex-player, a Victorian, um, what your thoughts were on, you know, how, what what is the feeling like over there? Is it something, is it good? Do you reckon it's going to be a good thing? Do you reckon it's going to go ahead? Uh, where do you sit with it, mate? Look, um... I'm all for um, expansion, and I've seen it revolve from having 12 Victorian sides to now have the, the two Adelaide sides, the two new, uh, Sydney sides, and uh, obviously Brisbane, and, uh, and uh, yeah, so it's been good. Yep. The only thing that worries me is, and you noted it before, I do still watch the footy a little bit, and I, over in Adelaide, I used to be recruiting. I used to recruit for Melbourne and also North. And mm, okay. I was also technical and developing officer. So I uh, had to recruit all the young kids for the Teal Cups, which is the under-18 championship. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I used to watch the games and watch them closely. And as I did on the weekend, I, I watched the, um, the Vic Metro. And um, I think they played WA. And then um, Vic Country played someone I can't really remember at the moment. But look... I look at the talent there and I just can't see enough talent coming in to fill another side. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I, I was like, you know, I watched the, um, is it the, I watched it, obviously I had a look at the Allies because there's two boys yep, there. They look there. okay, yeah. Yeah, I, that, well, that's, but that's it, that's taking in though, of course, Darwin, Sydney, Queensland and, and, and yep. whatnot. And obviously yep. there's a couple of good Tassie boys there, but I mean, that may be the issue, probably, probably now. I suppose different than when we were younger. There's a lot more sports now. Correct. Yeah, surfing, basketball. And, and then basketball I think a lot. You know, there's a lot of lot of sports. Anyway. Look, I, I'm all for it, but I think if Tassie's going to do it, they've got to do it correct. If they know they're going to get this license, and by all accounts they have, once they've got the ground completed, they'll be in. Um, but they're going to have to do it the correct way. In other words, start searching the planet now for a coach. Yep. Once they get that coach in place, let him start recruiting the players because I think you're going to be able to take players from each club, a certain amount of players from each club. I've heard that. I don't know if it's true or not. Okay. And then obviously put a fantastic program into place to, to um, bring your young fellas through. Well, with your development. Because what's happened with both Greater Western 
and and um, Gold Coast is they at one stage there Gold Coast had probably the best midfield of any side, and mm. then slowly they've all mm-hmm. left and gone back home to their like uh, Presti has gone back and. Uh, Dion Phil, Dion, someone's gone back. He's at Fremantle now. I mean, they've lost all their damn good players. Ablett retired, but then they've lost Stephen May and um, Lynch. They they all there, and they could make a fantastic side and win premierships. But they don't want to be there. Mm. If Tassie's going to do it, they're going to have to do it the right way. Make sure they're going to pick the players that are going to stay there. Do you think, uh, Darryl, do you think that um, what Tassie should be doing, it's only my opinion, so I'll just get your opinion on this. You was more like, obviously, being at Brunswick and around that when you grew up. I call that city, obviously. But, uh, you know, I looked at these country boys, uh, whether it's allies, whether it's Vic country, okay, South Australian country. Tassie's a bit of a, uh, a sleepy hollow, a little bit like a Geelong. And that's what's talked about down here. Do you think that if the recruiting or the recruiters, do you reckon they would be better actually getting kids that are probably don't like the big smoke as much mm. and actually actually get kids in that they feel that uh, may be more suited to uh, probably not such a fast pace? Well, I think you've got a good idea there for sure. You'd be looking at homegrown uh, personnel first and make sure that they're comfortable there and want to stay there. Well, that's it. But, yeah. Yeah. Not, just so I they mean, don't look, make the um, same mistakes as the Gold Coast, because yeah. the Gold don't, Coast is don't let them make the mistake. Like even now, Greater Western, you know, four years ago, they had their window. Yep. It looked like they were going to be anything. They had a great bunch, like a great squad. They made the grand final, and then they all started to wander and disappear. Yeah. And half of them now back here playing like uh, Taranto's at Richmond. Uh, you got uh, the guy at Co- uh, Essendon. They, they just keep coming back. They don't want to stay there. Do you, do you, do you think that the, Tas- the problem is that, and I, I get a little bit arc with this because I, obviously I did play you, but the, the Tasmanian bit, perhaps Tassie should have been in a lot longer, uh, a, 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 a long, long time, time ago. ago, I should say. Mm. They're not. Uh, yeah. I know they put in GWS and all that, but... I've been out there. My son played. He was in a representative side here, and they played out at uh, what do you call it, Blacktown. I'm going back quite yeah. a long time ago, and you walk around out there, they don't know footballers from one end to the other. Yeah. You know, they're not recognised. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. guys go to Sydney because they didn't want to be recognised. Yeah, uh, they're not football states. Here, it is predominantly mm. a football mm. state. The biggest problem we've got is it's very parochial between the north yep. and the south. Now, if they can get a happy medium, which I think they're trying to do, uh, then the thing is that I get is not just going to be people from Tasmania because we haven't got a massive population, but when the merry-go-round goes in, like if you're get, having kids from all over the country and, and some established guys, like would have been yourself, trying to get a game, you, you're on the verge, you, you know, you, you, you played a few games, you want to keep playing... Mm-hmm that they get the opportunity in a, in a place like this where they could actually establish themselves. But being a football state, I still feel that that holds... Uh, which, I, which, again, if I jumped to uh, Tasmania, played um, Queensland. Uh, it's a bit crowded. Locally, uh, our football's not great down here at the moment, but we still did beat Queensland, which is a pretty damn good effort when you think they've got Southport and you've got the, uh, you know, the Gold Coast and Brisbane and yep. all that. So, you know, to actually upset them and beat them, I thought was a pretty fair effort. So we do, uh, I suppose our sides here drop off in the local competition. But as a collective, we're pretty good. You know, we're, we're, still, we're still not too bad for a small state. And yep. I understand what you're saying. I think everyone has to be in if it's going to work. And I, I totally yep. agree with you, 100%, mate. Yeah. The new facility they're building, how many is it going to hold? That's the problem. 24,000. Yeah. 24, they yeah. were talking 24. Probably not enough, is it? I mean, yeah. the, a lot of people are saying that, you know, 24,000 is going to be too many, uh, too big because it's not going to get supported after a year. Yeah. And people will drop off. They won't go to the football. But I'm telling yeah. you now, in the first year, 24,000 memberships will be sold like that. 
it'll yeah. go. It'll go very, very quickly. Yeah. But the other, mm. the other question, Daryl, was that it's not just footy mm. for here for a place like this. It's also okay. Your, your bands. It's your it's your other entertainment that can filter yep. through there if they put a roof on top of it, yep. which they've said yep. they've got to have. So yep. it's a mini. I suppose it's a mini Marvel, isn't it? That's what they're talking about. Yeah. And is there companies there that'll become sponsors and? Oh, it, look, it hasn't been announced, but it, 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 you know it would be. You know that they'd have the naming yep. rights for the stadium, which they'd make a lot of money. And I've 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 heard the the government say, well, not the government, but the AFL saying that um, Tasmania stands to make uh, 170 million dollars a year just out of out of the stadium and people coming down here and tourism. And, yep. you know the you, pubs. You, and... Yeah, you're in the plumbing business, mate. I'm a glazier shop fitter in my own business down here, and I'm a tradie, but. Uh, back in the, there's a guy in in Launceston. His name's Errol Stewart, and he's a big developer up in Launceston. Yep. And that he said, and what he's concerned about, if this stadium here doesn't go ahead and they can it, he's worried that all the developers, like you said, the Kerry Goods that do the pubs and all that, that and the hotels and the motels, all around the state, they're going to pull out because they, if they keep yep. knocking back things here. Oh then it's going to be a real issue. So it's not just footy. It, 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 is, it is a whole, you know, I mean, obviously we've kept the, um, the basketball side. That's, that's done yep. very well. But uh, obviously there's a lot, football is a lot bigger thing um, with the money that's pushed yep. through it. So, yeah, it's going to be very interesting, mate. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure in time too, once Tassie gets established and gets up and running, They'll look for the 20th franchise, which will obviously come from Darwin or Alice yeah. Springs or somewhere there like that. Mm -hmm. So they've yeah. got to have it even so there's not a buy every week. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally agree. And, and you're, but you're no, right. look, it'll, it'll be good. Uh, it'll be good for the football. But as I said, I just, I just wonder whether there's enough quality footballers out there that can fill the side. I mean... I'm looking at North Melbourne a little bit at the moment now, and I shouldn't say too much, but, you know, I think at the moment we've got probably 12, 14 good players and the rest, you know, they're just making up the numbers. Mm. Yeah. This, and this, yeah. you don't want Tassie to start like that. You want, no, to have, no. you want to have 20 or, I mean, you've got to have 30 or 35 good players to choose from every week. So when you when you're saying that are you are you sort of gauging that there's 12 uh, AFL level players and maybe the rest of the team is is VFL level or uh, there's a there's a well they're young and and let's let's face it in time they develop but by the time they may develop the other ones are going to get too old like you know I'm saying yeah. in the next year or two we're going to lose Siebel we're going to lose Goldstein okay. Cunnington at the moment can't break back into the side and he's just about done as well so and there's a couple of others that's getting on, and by the time they step out and go, mm. these other younger ones will fill in, and then we'll have another batch behind them that will probably need to, you know, gain confidence and gain experience and stuff mm. like that. Where you really need to have, I don't know, ten real experienced good players in your side. Yep. So, so Daryl, these academies and that that say the Gold Coast have got an academy. And they pick yep. up a lot of guys from Darwin and that at the moment. So if Darwin yep. had a side like you you saying, which which it probably will happen, then they're not going to get those players anymore. That's it. So yep. it'd be the same with Tasmania. So it, it, I, I know they've already said Tasmania would have to have an academy yeah. like like the Swans. Mm. So that means what does that actually mean? Is does that mean they're picking kids up at trying to pick them up at? like 13 and 12, and they well, stay through till they're 18? Is that, what, how does that work? I think at some stages there, um, West Coast was doing that a little bit. They were spotting future stars and they were hiding them away so they didn't get drafted. But yeah, okay. there's too many recruiters out there now, nowadays that know everything that's going on and know yeah. every player that can play, and uh, it's very difficult to maintain them now. I mean... Uh, there's a guy going around in the Vic Country side at the moment, the under 18s, uh, Harley Reid. Yeah, yeah, he's been on all. Like, uh, he uh, was uh, he was one of the be he was one of the better players in the comp last year. Yep. Um, and unfortunately, none of the clubs could uh, recruit him because he was too in the younger age. But he's this year, young. I would dare say every club, or well, most of the clubs, would be certainly trying to have a crack at him if they could get their hands on him. Yeah, no, I had Even though you know he'll go to the first pick, I think he's already come out and said that he's not going to West Coast. So, 
he wouldn't. Yeah, well. So yeah, what's got to happen line. there is a club that does want him are going to have to offer offer West Coast a fair bit to be yeah. able to trade him. Well, yeah. that's that's the next question. Just on on quickly on recruiting. So if you do, you think then? So this is this a problem then with the kids today? So as I said to you about Tassie, if they, I'm using Tasmania because that's just yep. the way I think. But if they got kids from the country, I'm not saying they don't get some city guys too. That's, I'm not saying that. But if they predominantly got that and they fitted in to the, the lifestyle of what we've got. And and then, of course, uh, like, you, you know, you had your, as you said, your Harley Reid doesn't want to go to, say, West Coast. And the, the young kid that was at North Melbourne that's dominating now. Didn't want to be there. That's right. but Jason Horn Francis, he Jason did Horn not want Francis. to be at the club. Yeah, yeah. Ex exactly. So, but if you, do you think then when they get picked up as kids and they go to a club like Gold Coast or wherever yep. they go, North Melbourne, okay, they've just come into North Melbourne, should they should they be made if they sign, and yes. like you said, how much you wanted to play for North Melbourne, yep. and like I wanted to play down here in our league football here, so what, are you saying then that they should sign or be made at least do what I call an apprenticeship? Yes. Apprenticeship's four years. There you go. Right. I think years, that's a great it, idea. Could that could that happen, or would, would that not work? Or well, I, I think mean, that's what the AFL has got to come up with to say yeah. that if they get their concession picks and they get their top draft picks, and they sign them, it's not just a one year or two year. It's got to be four years. I agree completely with you. Got to be yeah. four years to keep them there, and then they might see, hey, this side has got a chance. Let's stay there. Let's uh, let's uh, work on it, and we can make it work. Well, one of the biggest gripes I've, I've got in North Melbourne are trying to establish itself now. Hawthorne, they're down there at the moment. Okay, they've had their fun in the sun, as I call it, but they're trying to establish now with a bunch of kids. West Coast, yep. they're going to have to do it. They're going to have to go back to the well, and they're going to have to start playing some of these kids, and they're going to go through a bit of hurt as well, and they're going to have to start building. So they're going to be looking at the young ones to push their, you know, to, to push their yep. clubs ahead oh. in the future, and they're going to have to keep them. And that's yeah. going to be the real problem. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be it's, damn interesting, mate. It is. Mm. It is. We got we got a little bit of an issue now, and I don't know how much of an issue it is, and I, I shouldn't really bring it up, but um, you know, we got young uh, Ben McKay, which is Harry's yes. brother. Yes. And right at the moment, I don't think he's signing contracts. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well. And that's not yeah. good. You know, the kid's young, although he's been in the system six years. We certainly need and He's him. been one of our good players for the last four or five. Yeah. Um, and now he's not signing. I mean, obviously, he's going to come... Um, if he if he doesn't sign, obviously, there'll be a lot of clubs chasing him, that's for My sure. Yeah, well, you, Carlton you, probably you, be the first well, one. You, you can't Carlton, just have guys, yeah, yeah, you can't just have guys going after four years and, or five no. years when their kids You've are... You've got to make them stay somehow. Yeah, I, I want to go to the top side so I can play in a grand final. That's exactly you can't yeah. That's what that. they all say. That's yeah, what they want. Like, anymore, like Lynch yeah, went to Richmond, he's played in three premierships. Yeah. Would he have played in the premiership at Gold Coast? No. Probably not. No, no. exactly okay. right. Mate, mate. We better call you. Let, let, let you go. It's been it's, it's such a thrill to talk to you and um, hearing some of your stories, mate. And geez, you've you've had some uh, some injuries, and as Glenn said, you've bounced back every time. And yeah, uh, just resilient. Yeah, absolutely, resilient, absolute mate. pleasure to meet you, and absolute pleasure to talk to you, mate. Yeah, it is. No, we appreciate you coming on, and uh, say hello to Roger for us. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> what we'd like to do, mate, we'll have to come over and have a beer with you. We'll get we'll get oh, in yeah. Melbourne. We'll, we'll we'll go to a pub. Us. Four of us and we five keep saying to Roger, we'll come and have a beer with you. We'll yeah, and I've got to do it. We've got to do Just it. We're all getting beer. older. We're yeah, doing, but it's good. But we all right. Well, thank you. Time. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. And uh, let's hope uh, the best side wins on Sunday because uh, no, he wasn't going to talk about that. But <laughs> <laughs> Go the race. It, it, it'll be a good game. Yeah. It should be. At any yeah. Rate. No. <laughs> We got a um, we got a past players function this Sunday, so oh, fantastic! I'm expecting a lot of uh, players. I've already heard Keith's coming, Wayne's coming, and um, I don't think Roger is because he's going away. Yeah, uh, I've got okay. Johnny Burns, Johnny Byrne, B Y R N E Burns, coming, and from the Burns B U R N S. So yeah, it looks 11. like it could be a good turn up. Oh, line, go. line them up for the frothy, mate. Right. <laughs> really good to talk to you. Um, okay, awesome. thanks a lot, guys.
Well, there you go, Glenn. Another fantastic interview, mate. How good was he tonight? He's very knowledgeable uh, with football, and uh, I learned a hell of a lot. So did and I. Uh, I tell you what, a guy that's had some um, some terrible injuries and that it just shows you football's not for the faint-hearted, mate. No, mate. Absolutely heartbreaking the story about the grand final. First, well, first game in VFL football and misses out. It's a, it's a must for anyone wanting to watch our show to find out just the uh, just how bad or how much a guy wants to play mm. and through injury mm. uh, had an interrupted career. Yeah. Anyway, guys, that's it for us tonight. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Please uh, like, subscribe, share it, tell your friends. This is what we do on the Friday Frothy. Have a great weekend. Hey guys, I'm Reviews. You're listening to the Friday Frothy. What a fantastic.